Rick is our guest, uh, a great patriot and, and, and honorable man here. Um, Jerry has a lot of questions. And uh, Rick will have the floor. And uh, during your time, you can ask some questions button. about the Magna Carta, et cetera, et cetera. But pause. The floor is now Rick's. Rick, it's your floor. Thank you very much. Um, always honoured to uh, to be meeting with other people who are actually trying to do something positive in the world. Uh, lots of people talk, very few people do. Um, as mentioned, uh, I'm from England. Um, I am currently subjugated by the British Crown, as we as are we all. Um, uh, I'm actually from Manchester, so northwest um, of England. Um, a little bit about myself, I suppose. I've always sort of like studied various types of alternative knowledge from being about seven years old. Um, started off with UFOs and aliens and... Hey, hey pause, and pause. History and... Just keep, give me, pause, everybody. Mute all their mics. They got dogs in the background. Some, you know, I mean, the noises. Seriously. Rick will answer, answer all your questions. So keep your mics. Out of respect. Okay, sorry, Rick. Uh, am I good to go again? So, uh, yeah, I um, started off studying like, God, when I was seven years old, I was always interested in anything to do with the paranormal or anything that was alternative to, to mainstream knowledge. Um, I grew up in a bit of a weird duality whereby my, my dad was a like hard scientist, pure theist, didn't believe in anything to do with you know spirituality or religion. Uh, and my mum was a born again Christian. And I sort of always had the respect for science, which I don't know, it almost seemed genetic. I suppose my dad was a a commissioning engineer for power stations so um he, he did work on boilers and stuff like that um, nuclear power plants coal fired and all sorts all over the world um so i've always wanted to kind of bring those two perspectives together because i i always when i went to church with my mom i, f I felt something touch me that's the only way i could describe it it was but a lot of the the reasoning behind the religion never made sense to me and the fact that there was a division between science and religion kind of didn't make sense to me either because um the way i figured it if if god was real then he wrote the laws of the universe anyway so it, it, it didn't make sense that there was a conflict um that was sort of always been the, the root of my search for truth i suppose was, was trying to bring those two aspects of my being together my you know inner standing that there was something more to the universe and, and my understanding of the scientific principles and the scientific method and stuff. Um, the first real bit of alternative knowledge I read was um, Graham Hancock. That uh, no, wasn't Graham Hancock. It was um, Eric von Daniken's uh, Chariots of the Gods. So I started to get inklings of, um, you know, a, a greater history that's been hidden from us um, via various ancient knowledge of celestial bodies that you know shouldn't be possible without telescopes and stuff um, that that really intrigued me and, and always got me asking questions about that and you know a lot of the sort of ancient megaliths as well particularly uh, and that's what really led me to start looking into what was going on with, with British history because we've got this ancient monolith in uh, Wiltshire it's 2,500 BC estimated, according to their calendar, at the very least, 2,500 years before the birth of Christ. You got 25 ton stones. Um, some stones were moved as far as 150 miles away from the place that they were originally quarried. And I'm looking at that and thinking, why was I told that we were barbarians? That That is not something that was built by a, a race of barbarians you've either got a vast amount of excess energy or you've got access to some advanced technology. There's on, those are the only two ways that a society builds something of that magnitude. Either they've got a vast amount of excess labor, which means they're not subsistence farmers and hunter gatherers, then that's not the society that's doing it, or they've got advanced technology, which makes the task incredibly easy. That 
so as far as I was concerned, we should know about our ancient history. This should be something we were being taught in school and not, not a blip, not a wink. The first thing I ever learned in history was that we were invaded by the Vikings and the Saxons and then the Romans. And that's, that's all I was ever taught of British history. You've been invaded and subjugated, you've been invaded and subjugated, you've been invaded and subjugated, and you've been invaded and subjugated. And, uh, you know, I think that's one of the, the big ways that they, well, it's, it's provably the ways they enslave a people, isn't it? They separate you from your history. Because when you don't have access to your heritage anymore, you don't have anything worth fighting for. And I mean, they did that with the black state slaves in America. They banned all their, you know, all mention or, or anything of their writing or items brought from their original lands. They tried to completely obliterate the culture um, in order to, you know, make them subservient. And I suppose, you know, that thing was prototyped over here in, in these islands. Um, as I've sort of gone into um, my latest studies of British history, I've then um, realised that we weren't actually subjugated for the Romans by the Romans for as long as we thought, because if you look at mainstream history, they'll say the Romans were here to around 650 uh, AD. Um, and in reality, they didn't never really got a stronghold here at all. They were constantly fought back by incredibly organized militias that fought an asymmetric war against them for the whole time they were here. And they were only really on these lands for about 200 years, after which we chased them off and then sacked Rome. Um, and as I've come to understand it, the, the, the culture of Christianity actually came from England and went to Rome from England. The Romans didn't bring Christianity here. We brought Christianity to the Romans. Um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that perhaps Jesus himself even lived in England, in Wales actually, um, for a, a, some time and was even buried over here. Now, I'm not sure how much, you know, there is actual truth to that claims, uh, but that's the alternative history that you can find when you start digging into things. Um, Turns out King Arthur was actually based on two real kings that we have, two of our ancient lost kings, um, the second of which I believe was actually involved in chasing the Romans off our lands, uh, the first of which was um, resisted one of the original Roman invasions um, and chased them off in the first place. Um, but then sort of digging into everything that was, was going on, a lot of our written history is fairly sparse before around a thousand AD uh, when we were invaded by the Normans uh, and they established the, the Norse land patents which is what we now know as um, our counties I suppose um, like Lancashire and Yorkshire uh, stuff like that I would actually be in Lancashire for any of those interested that would have been my ancient shire um, and this is the place that Anna von Reitz um, advised me in an email to start from if I was trying to find, you know, a route back to the land and soil, the, the Norse land patents are the closest thing that you, you're going to get to land jurisdiction. There's very few maps of actual planned out areas on the land before that, because originally it was a, a, one unified kingdom. Um, that was uh, ruled or caretaker, I suppose, because uh, our ancient kings weren't, weren't um, absolute. They could be overthrown by their people. It was a position of respect. It was, um, you know, a, a conditional head of state. You didn't rule with an iron fist. You looked after your people. That's the ancient tradition of the British kings. They were, um, you know, the defenders of the lands. They were the people who marshaled the armies when the pe when people came to try and take our lands away from us. They were def defenders rather than, you know, uh, subjugators, so to speak. This is long before the Anglo-Saxons and Rome and, and, and all the rest of that influence. But from uh, around 1000 AD, it would seem, um, the Romans have had done their best to try and get their greasy paws on our land uh, and they've done that by encouraging various Catholic kings and queens from all over the world to come and invade our lands and take control of the populace basically and that's where it started with the, with the Norse. Um, I believe he was uh, a Catholic, um, William the Conqueror um, or William the Bastard is often known um, but unfortunately his maps are the first time we actually see in, in you know a 
an actual defined area to England, and, and that's kind of where our um, formalised structure of government has, has ultimately come from. Um, originally, it was a, a king that was ruled by uh, that uh, had a set of lords which operated the lands around, and uh, the people lived on the lands, and the lord looked after the people. Um, and this was probably, you know, it's arguments one way or the other whether this was benevolent rulership or whether it was, you know, malevolent rulership. I'm not really interested either way. Um, but I can see the merits of having such a structure when it's going to take you maybe two weeks by horse to get a message from one side of the country to another. Um, it makes sense to have that sort of distributed level of, of control. Again, you want local kings able to marshal a local army while your messengers are, are off to let everybody else know what on earth is happening. Um, so I can understand back then why some people might have thought that was a good way to, to organize the, you know, the way they were living. Anyway, over many, many years, it, they've been corrupted. Um, and various entities have tried to get their greasy paws in there. Um, mainly it has been uh, the Catholic Church. Um, since we beat back Rome in terms of military might, they must have decided that the way to influence us was long term via religion. Uh, and our ancient spirituality, our ancient Christianity, which wasn't called anything, was defined as paganism by the Catholic Church. And they had a very rigid doctrine about the way you worshipped, in stark contrast to the way the Britons were. It was quite free, you know, you were free to find your own relationship with God as long as you understood and lived in it in a moral way, then, you know, no one was going to bother you. Um, anyway, the Catholic Church have come in and increasingly controlled people's relationship with God, and that's been how they've learned to manipulate people's morals and got them to accept uh, ever increasing types of slavery, uh, the divine right of kings, etc, etc, etc. It would seem that through our past, at numerous times, people have figured out there was something wrong going on and tried to overturn that. But any overturning has been short lived and eventually they've weaseled their way back in. Um, the big documents that we're, we're talking about here in terms of actually defining our government were the Magna Carta um, around 1217 to 1225, 1225 being the final copy thereof. Um, and um, the Charter of the Forest is the companion document that not a lot of people know about. Uh, now, the Magna Carta was the document of the barons, so it defined people as being serfs living beneath uh, the barons who would then um, living under the king. So there's your hierarchy, kings at the top and beneath is the barons and then underneath them we've got the lords, etc. and then serfs who are the fee paying public, so to speak. Um, now, back then, this was something, again, that people still opted for. Um, however, the Magna Carta was, had the companion document of the Charter of the Forest, and the Charter of the Forest was the document of the free men, which were a group of people who did not live underneath the barons. Um, and this document didn't change. While the Magna Carta changed with each iteration, the only change in the Charter of the Forest, when you follow it through, um, is that it was to a different monarch. The first one was to John, who was known as John Lackland because he was never expected to inherit the throne in the first place, um, but through some jiggery pokery ended up in that position. Um, and then I can't remember who it was that came after it. I'll have to apologise to all my Brits out there for not remembering our history, uh, but the, it was uh, the only change to uh, reference the following monarch in the second edition of the Charter of the Forest. Uh, and what that basically said in it that was that any man, and this is the first document I've ever found in British law to differentiate a man from a person, it said any man cannot be held before um, courts of the forest unless it is, um, they are assurities for a person held for forest offences. So this defines the difference between the living man and someone who holds the office of personhood. And this is the, the, the big thing that we need to sort of reference when we're trying to reset our um, constitution and bring things back to the people. Uh, because our, our legalese and our law has been manipulated and edited and got so many loopholes in it because it's 
over a thousand years old. It's so complex that there's no way that any man on the street can figure it out. Um, and if we can reference the chart of the forest, we can bring people out of the office of personhood into the law of the land, and then they are not then subject to those forest offences because they're not choosing to be that person who can be held accountable. And that's what it all really sort of boils down to, as I can understand it. There's an awful lot of a mess that's occurred after that, but if we're cutting it down to brass tacks and we want to get to the way out for not only the English, Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish, but any country that is part of the Commonwealth, you can, th there it is, that's the proof that you can overthrow your rulers. Because in there, there is a clause that says, um, when viewed by good and lawful men, we may disafforest the land of the monarch. And to disafforest means to turn it back into common woodlands once again, because the, in the ancient days, you differentiated between woods, which were common lands, and forests, which were royal lands, and they were held for hunting. So that's where, it, in our constitution, you can identify the, the point where the free men, who at that time they say there was only 10% of people who, who didn't live under baron, uh, baron, baronial rule, or a monocle rule, um, what it said there was that if you mess about, um, if we decide that your lands um, are, you're not managing the lands correctly, then they will be forfeit. And only lawful men can do that. Only, only men who are not persons of the forest can do that. So we have to assert that right. Um, and I, I love what you guys are doing out here. I think it's absolutely amazing because you're doing what the Americans tried to do a long time ago and what we tried to do in uh, the mid 17th century uh, when we cut off the head of our monarch, which was write a new constitution. And what's important about this is that like, you know, the American, um, original American constitution, the way the founding fathers intended it to be, it was a document that was written for the common man. It was written in the common tongue and anyone can pick up that document and read it and comprehend what it is saying. Unlike any other legal documents that are produced now, statutes and bills, they're this awful mess of cross-referencing hundred-year-old laws and back-referencing other laws and, you know, appendixes and, you know, amendments and, and all this nonsense. So they make it this complicated web. How can anyone be expected to adhere to a law that they can't even understand? And that's why it's so important. We, we bring it down to brass tax and make it down as simple as, as morals and everyone being responsible for their own actions. No more of this nonsense like uh, your mother would have said, uh, if Frank told you to put your hand in a fire, would you do it? Well, no, of course you wouldn't. And it seems that everybody forgets that when they become an adult and everyone just does what they're told because they're told to do it, even if they know it's wrong. And we need to get back to, you know, that basic moral teaching and that's what we need to build our, our whole const our new constitutions on and it needs to be simple enough that everyone can agree on it and no more complicated than that because anything outside of that is down to personal interpretation and if you get it wrong then you, you know you need to pay up for that and I think that's what a lot of people will be scared of growing up becoming an adult moving out of their mom and dad's house it's interesting, Rick, when you were talking about uh, uh, all of the laws and statutes and ordinances and rules and regulations and acts and statutes and, you know, it's, it's a morass, uh, right? It's, uh, uh, I think they total about 60 million laws, different laws. And anytime you go yeah. to a lawyer, he has an entire office full of staff to help sort through all of that stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, we've, we've all heard the expression, uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse. But unfortunately, that was originally intended for the common law, which don't hurt somebody, don't take the stuff, do what you say you're going to do. Everybody would know that. That's, that's, that's common sense, which seems to be not so common anymore. So for somebody to use that ignorance of the law is no excuse. Um, but, 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 but reasoning. Mike. Mike. Yeah. 
the laws that, that were created by, by natural law or the law of man. Right. And, and you know, it, there was a law that was created by natural law. That was an amazing law. Bring no harm to your brother, to your sister. And the king in 1666 he changed the laws. And that's that's really what changed our our our, our freedom. And that's important for everybody to know this. You know. The greatest gift we have, well, I'll tell you right now, I brought Rick in to talk to you. The reason is, is very important. Uh, and there's, the, the, like next week, I, I had a gentleman come in last week, right? And uh, he sat in, he sat in, he sat in the Zoom room. And he destroyed Trump, but nobody knew who he was. He told you the truth. Sometimes, I want you all to pause. You know why? Could you imagine the knowledge that Rick has? By the way. He can speak it so fluently and clearly. I didn't choose these men or these soldiers or these women. Now they're here. Ask your questions for their gifts are very, very, very important now. So I'll tell you, this man that's speaking in the room tonight is a man, and his life is in jeopardy, what he's saying. So I want you guys to ask your questions very carefully, and he has everything to give you knowledge. Like I said, the war we're involved is is severe. Well, Mike, there was a there, Jerry. Jerry had some questions. So Jerry, Jerry had some questions, questions for, for my friend Rick. Correct? Yes or no? Uh, this is uh, this is Jerry. Your, your mic's off, Jerry. Jerry, your mic's off, Jerry. Mic. Microphone, Jerry. It's on mute. Okay, Here. I'm back. Hello, Rick. Thanks for joining us. I was just uh, wondering um, how our problems in North America differ from your problems in Europe. Or, if you will, please make the link as how they're similar. Well, I think when it comes down to it, because a lot of it was exported by empire, I would imagine that because your laws are basically, a, a lot of Western law is derived from um, English law, um, with it being exported from um, Britain, and by the crown, um, I believe all the um, all attorneys are um, franchises of the British um, a British accredited register. So the bar, the AR. Um, uh, so you've got the American Bar Association. Bar Association. You've probably got the uh, Canadian Bar Association. They're all basically franchises of the same base law, um, and they may have mutated a little since they were exported to those lands, but ultimately it all tracks back through 
to the, the British and, and British law. Um, and when it comes to common law as well, that's a word we've got to be quite careful with, because although it originally did mean the common law, like the law of, of the common people, it's, you know, why you behave the way you behave in public, the, the sort of things that you just naturally do in, in, in the public sphere, what it has been co-opted to mean is the statute law. So if you say common law in a maritime court, they will take that as statute law because that's what it's been co-opted to mean. And, and that's basically been the root of a lot of what they've done is they've created this code and they've redefined the meaning of words in order to get us to, without our knowledge, agree to be subjected to a system of corporate rulership, because that's what it is ultimately. Um, all of the entities which purport to be our government are actually corporations, and you can find them registered on the various company websites for your nation, which again are usually franchises of the British company's house. Uh, which is managed by the City of London, and that's where all of the franchising came from. Uh, and that franchising started originally um, in the 14th century with the very first um, franchises that were created. Actually, it was at the end of the 13th century, and the Crown um, Charters, basically. Uh, and the first two were for Oxford and Cambridge universities, which is why they are an absolute cesspit of misinformation and where all our politicians come from, because these are, corp these are crown controlled corporations, um, oh. which is then crown is also controlled by the, by the Vatican. Um, and the first corporation was actually the first commercial corporation was the Saddlers. Um, and if you think of that in a 14th century, when everyone is getting around on horses, You've just given one company the monopoly on the production of saddles. Like that's serious money that that's being made right there, because that one company, if they're not making the saddles, then they have to authorize someone else to do it. And if you can't, if you can't prove that that entity is authorized you to do it, then you're breaking the law and you can be arrested for it. And mm. there was the beginning of sort of the corporate influences over the way that the world works, as I understand it. It might okay. go further back than that in terms of the Vatican, but in terms of what's gone on the land of so land and soil of England and Britain, that's what I can tell you. Okay, so um, I, I'm from originally. I'm from the East Coast, so my forefathers were settlers. And can I ask you about the real world, the railroad? About oh, the railroad. Okay. So the railroad was built. The railroad was built, and then came the Confederation. Is it true? So you mean in terms of like the Industrial Revolution? Yes, that's where yes, we're going with this uh, one. Yeah. Um. Well, that that was sort of the beginning of of the mass con the control of the mass means of production, wasn't it? Because when God, I can't remember what, what year it was that the steam engine was made. Can anybody tell me that? I'm rubbish on dates with my history. That might give me a sort of a better idea of, of where it slots in with law and stuff like that. The early 1800s. I could have a look on my phone. The early 1800s. About the 1800s. I think so. So, I mean, sort of, I can't really speak to how the invention of the railroad has, has had an influence, honestly, in terms of my... Um, research I've got up to about the 1600s and in that period you've seen a massive explosion of uh, corporate charters being created this is basically when the city of London corporation was being populated and it was the same time that we had two three revolutions I think in a hundred years something like that and they've not all been called revolutions they've, they've given them different names to try and play with our, with our history but basically you know we, we decapitated one monarch um we had martial law for a while we had a, an attempted republic for a while we put another monarch on the throne and then overthrew that monarch and the number of deposed monarchs we've had in that period of time um it just speaks to an awful lot of the real groundwork being laid in this country around around that time. 
Um, that's also when you started to get the, the British Empire expanding uh, via the, the East India Company. That was in the mid 17th century. Um, and what I learned for the first time in my life um, was that it wasn't actually the British, it wasn't the British Navy that was going out there. It was a company. It, it was a corporation that was going out there. And what we've been led to believe is basically they went out there as peaceful traders and then had to defend themselves against the savages. No, they were going out there with cannons and guns and horses in the first place. They were going out, they were, these were privateers. They were, you know, hired guns. They were mercenaries. Oh, oh for conquest. We oh, for... Yeah, <laughs> and, and I've always been led to believe that it was, you know, the British Empire, and it wasn't. That was the city of London Empire, that. And all the, that's the reason that all the money that came into the British Empire never made it to anybody at the bottom. And the reason we've always lived in squalor while the people at the top have just rolled in the lap of luxury because of the fact it was corporations going out there in the first place and, and you know, civilizing people. Um, and, you know, I, I was never a great lover of empire or any great believer of that anyway. It just never sat right in my spirit, but to, to learn that it was actual corporations. And again, the West Africa Company. And again, this, this ties back to, to militaries as well. What 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 is a company well it's that's a military designation as well and this is when you start to realize that all companies are set up as part of a military hierarchy this is warfare that that goes on in the business world this isn't trade and this is why business exists in the maritime domain because maritime law is the law of warfare it's not the law of peace it's the law of war and this is why corporations exist in maritime warfare. And this is why you can have aggressive takeovers and they seem perfectly legitimate because it exists in the maritime domain. It doesn't exist in land law because land law is all about peace, cooperation and self-defense. And you don't need a vast army to have those things. You only need a big army if you're invading. If you're a peaceful nation, all you need is a well-armed populace that are reasonably trained and a small handful of professional soldiers. That's all you need. You're here. And I tell you what, I, 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 can, I can see the, uh, is it the, the Swiss method where literally every single person is trained in the basic use of um, a rifle and every adult has a government issued rifle that they are responsible for maintaining. Because if anyone tries to invade them tomorrow, every single person can turn around and you've got an instant militia ready to defend their terrain. Uh, and I think that's ultimately what, what we you know, need to think about as sovereigns as well, because if, if you want freedom, if you want sovereignty, you have to be willing to defend everyone's sovereignty and everyone's freedom, because if it's a threat to someone else, it's a threat to you. And we need to come to that basic understanding that it only works if we all sort our shit out and, uh, and agree that we need to stand up for ourselves because no one else is going to do it. Yeah. Yep. I have also a question. What, in fact, I have to... Uh, what can you tell uh, me about uh, the civil law? Because we have uh, in Quebec here, the civil law and also in France, in Europe. And um, the other question is how the business uh, has to be done under the natural law. Okay, so civil law, um, and, and this is one of those words I've learned to um, recognize um, as differentiating. So if you hear maritime or admiralty, that is the British Crown um, law. That's where it all comes from. Yeah. If you hear ecclesiastical or you hear, um, what, I can't remember what word it was that you used, uh, civil law, that's Roman law. That's the Vatican. Okay. And these are the two different jurisdictions of the sea, which is maritime admiralty law, and the air, okay, which is spiritual law, according to the Vatican Church, okay, and civil law came about because the original international jurisdiction before the time of great navies was the Vatican, 
if you wanted to make sure that your lands weren't going to be invaded by the next king or queen to come along, you had to have your rulership of the land ratified by the Pope. If the Pope oh, didn't no. say it was okay, then you wouldn't be uh, sure that you know the next Catholic wouldn't come along and invade your lands. That place and has civil to go. law ties back to Rome, as far as I understand it. Wow. Um, that Vatican building has to go, my friend. Got, got, got to destroy that building. Where's your charger? This can be done under the natural law. Oh, great. Uh, if, if I can throw something in here, I recall uh, years ago working with a fellow from uh, a couple of guys from uh, Belgium, I believe it was. And uh, the standard procedure in uh, Belgium is that when a, a person graduates high school, they are compelled to spend a year in the army. And what it does is it trains them uh, in, in uh, like you're saying, uh, use of guns, self-defense, uh, um, uh, physical fitness, uh, careers, and so on. And no obligation to stay after the year. But what that will do is that will uh, give them an opportunity to get a view of life that they wouldn't get in a regular school setting or uh, if they went straight from school into work. Plus, it would maintain so a constant standing army. I, I, I think that's a pretty good Michael, idea. Mike, yes, sir. Michael. Yes, sir. Okay. So, and you know, some, I remember, I remember Dennis Shaw told me this, right? Uh, when he graduated, uh, he had a sort of two years in the military. In 1980, I had to serve five years in the military. And uh, after studying uh, many, many great men like uh, Stuart Longhorse, I understood that the indoctrination of military trained us to kill. Lethal weapons to kill. That was our fucking job. To kill. And kill. Seriously. Kill, 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 kill. So, Stuart Longhorse told me in the new world we're not going to teach our children our children to kill. We're going to teach our children to love. And then the mothers will, will bear the children to be something amazing. So we've been indoctrinated for years to kill, 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 kill. And uh, the military complex it's taken many of us. And that's, all, that's, all, that's all we know. I always find it funny. You can be the greatest protector to the nation, but as soon as you come back to your nation, you are a threat to the nation. It's the truth. So we're not we're not going to, to chain our children to kill. The mothers are going to raise their children. To love, different, seriously, it's important. In the transition period, our children will will be protectors, not killers anymore. They'll protect their mothers and their and their and their families, and they'll learn to be better. And the world will change because the mother. Will be in control. And the Nea said to me, Tamers, the child is the most important thing. I hear you, brother. Oh, no. Yeah, that's, yep. that's the truth. Okay. I hear so, you, brother. The, you know, I'm ex military. Yeah. I'm giving you my knowledge. And uh, I listened, I listened to all of this. And I spent many months trying to figure this out many years, the transition has to be totally different. That's important. Um, Jerry served in the military. Um, 
I look at uh, Nick, Nick, Nicky Hurley. He's in the military. This guy is so fucking dysfunctional with PTSD. He yells at his four-year-old children. Anger. Hate. <laughs> and he does. You know why? Because we weren't trained as individuals. We we're trained as men. And we only knew one thing. Kill, 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 kill. Yes, very, very good points. Uh, now, to go back to today's laws, um, Canadian laws to English laws right now, like, I'm not too sure, like, I, I like to stay current with the news and whatnot, and I'm getting confused with England, the UK, and the European Union, and all that kind of stuff. What laws do they actually adopt? Like, does this maritime law, well, how rampant is it? Because I remember during World War II, uh, the Free Merchant Navy was actually quite military. Uh, what's, what yeah. do you think? Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I'm just going to start with your last point, uh, the free merchant navy. That's a very interesting one. Um, they actually still maintain a merchant navy. I have a friend who is a cap. Uh, he's not a captain, uh, but he he sometimes operates the helm on a merchant navy ship. And the way he describes it, because I asked him, like, are you civilian or are you military? How does that work? And he said, well, basically. When they want us to be military, we're military and we carry military hardware. But when they want us to be civilian, we're civilian. They spend most of the time busting drug runners, basically. That's what they do. Um, they're like a, a police force of sorts, I suppose, um, in the Caribbean busting drugs. That's what I understand. Um, he told me he'd handled about 30 million pounds worth of cocaine once. Um, on a bust, but um, yeah, yeah, so they're, they're, they sit in a weird place. Uh, and again, they'll be under maritime law because they're on the sea. And when you're on the sea, maritime law applies. Um, that's, that's just how it works. Um, and that is one of the reasons why um, I think America is set up the way it is. Uh, America, the way it was set up in a republic, was designed in such a way that the individual states themselves do not have access to maritime jurisdiction. They only have access to land jurisdiction, which was, you know, the, the commonly agreed constitutions of the people. That's what constitutes land jurisdiction. We decide it because there's God, then there's the land, and then the, the sea sits on the land, and the air sits on top of the sea and the land. But, you know, the, the root of it all is the land. You wouldn't have any ocean without the land because underneath the ocean, what do you find? You yeah. find the land. And that's why the land jurisdiction stands supreme to maritime jurisdiction, admiralty jurisdiction, you know, civil jurisdiction, that they all will accept that that the land is, is supreme jurisdiction. And that's what we're invoking by doing our, our, our original constitutions. And this is something that we can change at any point because there's, you know, there's the creator and then there's us and we live on the land. We're not, we're not sea mammals, we're, we're land mammals and we exist on the land and the land is the firmament. That's the, you know, you've got to remember a lot of the roots of our history have come from our spiritual understanding of the way the universe works and as far as we were concerned the land was at the, the root of everything and everything was built upon the land itself so in, in, in today's terms like when a boat an international boat hits port what happens well the boat always remains in international jurisdiction the boat itself is still in international water. It's still international. They're quite interesting places, boats, because when you're on a boat, the captain is basically the king. And that's how they're able to um, force us to live under corporate jurisdiction. Because they've not when, defined when you as living on the land. What they've defined you as is living on a ship, which is docked on the land. 
that's where you are and it's it's a ship that has the shape of the country and the shape of the land or the shape of the city and they call it the color the color of law so it's like a thing but it's not the thing and they've so convinced the you that that you live on the color of canada rather than on canada you live on something that is legally like calendar the canada but not actually canada because canada is a piece of land they've put you in maritime jurisdiction. It's a mm. trading vessel. And they've defined you... your vessel as being a ship. Yes. Rather and, than and the these... piece of land, which is what and it these is. Ships, and these ships, they just change their flags regularly. Yeah. And no, yeah. Matter, no matter whether, which port they're moored to, like as far as I could understand, um, if you're tied to a piece of land, you, you should be on that land. Like international waters are at a certain distance from shore. Mm -hmm. So uh, at one sense, you're saying that international law is still within the port? Yes, because of the vessel. Because it's defined as being a vessel. If you if you're in the water, just off. If you literally jump over the board overboard of the vessel into the water, then you're in international waters, and you are well, you're in territorial waters and part of the land jurisdiction for sure. In that case, yeah. But um, that's not where you are. You're currently defined as being on the ship. In fact, the way the way it works, I believe the, the best analogy, and it's again, I'm not using legalese, I'm just talking common tongue here, is that they've they've claimed that they found your vessel adrift without an owner and salvaged it and your, you, the living person, is missing presumed debt. So they have salvaged that under maritime law and because you've not claimed that vessel back it's under their jurisdiction they own it um now the way salvage law works is normally you've got i think it's nine years or seven years or there's a certain amount of time you've got to reclaim it you can just claim it back off them it's yours you know you pay them a certain percentage of you know the value of that thing and, and you get it back but here's the key they have to make it public that they've salvaged that vessel. They have to tell you. They have to make reasonable efforts to find the owner of the vessel to let them know they've salvaged it. And they never did that, which means it's fraudulent in the first place. So you can rip that, that whole thing apart at the very, very base level. And if you declare yourself as being a man and you can produce other living witnesses that can say you are that man or woman that was born on that day then if they ever try and take you into the court as far as i'm concerned you never pass the bar because if you notice in in their sort of courts there's always this ornate bar that looks an awful lot like the side of a ship perhaps that they they want you to go into when you go into the courtroom and you never pass that over you show them your documents over the side and you say i'm not a ship I'm a living person and I will not stand into your jurisdiction. You've got no authority over me. I'll see you later. I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. You do it a lot more precisely than that. But if you have the correct set of documents prepared, as I've understood it from reading the work of Anna von Wrights and anyone who hasn't uh, really wants to try and get their head around it, it's well worth looking at the stuff that she's done because she spells it out in far better detail than I ever could um, and actually describes exactly what it would look like she writes it in, in one a beautiful article which i'll try and share with you at some point um exactly what it would sound like if she walked into one of their courts and it would involve you schooling the judge and then walking out can you can you give us that name again please uh, rick anna von Wright. oh yeah okay yeah so Rick, what is your opinion about um, the business under the natural law? So how this will be done? So this is this is just trade, and and this is a, again an important distinction we need to make. Any 
so what's an exchange is is the fundamental thing that happens in a trade there's two ways that can happen if you're trading under land jurisdiction that's just called trade if you're trading in maritime jurisdiction it's called commerce okay and all trade involves is a um a contract between two people that they both agree on mm -hmm. that's it that's it that's it it's as simple as that as long as both parties agree on it then we're okay and the, the the issue there comes with the semantics of meaning of words and this is why there needs to be um a, a business domain we need some sort of people to to understand how business works and there is actually a separate dictionary for the land jurisdiction which is where trade occurs rather than commerce trade occurs in land jurisdiction and for purposes of trade agreements there is a another law dictionary and that's um bouvier's bouvier's law dictionary now a lot of people reference this black's law dictionary which is the law dictionary of maritime and admiralty jurisdiction there is i believe a separate dictionary for civil jurisdiction as well this is how how sneaky they are they use different words in different jurisdictions um and bouvier's um spelt the french way um is the jurist is the um the dictionary for the land jurisdiction and you would use that for contracts to make sure that everybody knew that there was no misunderstandings because you know if i say god someone might think i'm talking about a bearded man in the sky when i'm not and there's a lot more finesse in, in words when you're talking about contracts that's important to have because we don't want anybody getting short change because when he said you know as soon as possible i thought you meant two weeks and i actually meant two months because i've got a really full diary and we never quite talked about that you know there's all there's all sorts of finesse that needs to be made with the language when it comes to trade so yeah um there would need to be um a method by which we can easily draw up contracts for different services and, and we need to collectively agree on that and again that would all be part of of the constitution the expanded constitution i imagine once you get beyond you know how we organize our um government then we talk about how we trade between ourselves equitably because that's the the main thing is making sure we've got contracts that we can both understand and that we can both agree on and that as long as that happens then the trade is lawful right which which law do you guys use in england so it's it's the same um, everyone uses blacks your law dictionary at the minute because that's your maritime admiralty jurisdiction um, I, I think there might be a different one for civil law i could be wrong um, again law in particular is not my strong point i'm better with the philosophy and the history and i'm getting better on my law but it's something that i never really tackled because it is it's a mess english law particularly like i say we're looking at a thousand years um, of written law at least um, and someone i know calculated that you were looking at about 40 400 mil uh, 400 man years of labor to read all of them wow. that's the mess that we're looking at 400 man years and that's why you will never Which... find a single lawyer that covers all the law they're all in very very specific small pieces of law family law or you know criminal law but specifically drugs or or this or that and, and that's because it's so complicated there is actually not very very few people who understand all of it and what i'm trying to do is, is sift through and, and allow all the nonsense to fall out and find those little little gems of things that we can use because they have created loopholes for themselves to get themselves out of these systems and as much as we want to build our own system and have nothing to do with them i want to know that when it comes to the crunch that people are going to be protected if they do try to be brought in front of their courts we need something that will work in their court as well because while we're trying to bring this into you know being they, they will try and get us any way we can and we need to know their law well enough that we can school them with it uh, and that's why i've mentioned anna von Wright because she, her her knowledge of it is absolutely supreme it goes way over my head 
And again, I just pick out the gems that I know I need. Okay, okay, okay. Hey, brother. Your your truth is, is amazing. That's important. You you you've learned this truth, right? No man or woman. Um, excuse me. Um, Rick. Hey, Rick. Um, sorry, I, I had you on mute there. But in your opinion, was was that deliberate to write it that complicated that they would take that many man hours to read it? Yeah, yeah, of course it is. That's been part of the whole the whole plan in the first place. They make no, it right. so complicated that there are you loopholes there that they can use when they need it. And that, like I say, you need someone else to understand it. And this comes down to my, you know, my biggest thing, which I think will get people on board is to remind them that like You've got this vast, could you imagine the size of the library that would be needed to contain all these documents? And I've just Which, told you 400 man years. There's no way any person is ever understanding all of that. And how can you ever be expected to abide by that sort of law? That's it's, right. It's got, it, we've got it, to be able to make it simpler than that. In which language is that written to you guys in England? Um. Well, here's the interesting thing, and this is another reason why I know it was it was created in order to um, subjugate us without our knowing, is that for the longest time, our monarchs who were creating this law spoke French as their common tongue. Their, their first language was French. Oh, and they in were England, in the it was station, French. And they were writing the law in French. Later, it was then written in Latin which again, the common person did not speak. And now it's, it's written in something that looks like English superficially on the surface and a common person might oh, read so it. Rick, go, Rick, 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 maybe Rick, I pause. understand that. So Rick, pause a second. So well, what we've done, we, we've created a document and basically, right? Some grade six to grade ten, which will be translated to Latin, and uh, the Latin language can never be to, can never be changed. This is very important, and what Rick's asking you is this question. Uh, every song I'm going to bump in. The language is very important for, for the people need to know they are sovereign. For the people, no, they, they never made a contract with Satan. It's very important. And thirdly, is that they are the true sovereigns of this nation. And that's the most important thing. For they never give their gifts away to a foreign corporation. And that's important. They may be uh, usurped to, uh, to, to uh, usury or and uh, my belief, my heart is this. For those who walk in the midst, not knowing where they're going, but they've never been told the truth. As slaves, they will be slaves. But now they have men that are going to correct these issues. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So My it's very important. It's very important. Ignorance of the man is the only ignorance of themselves. For those who dwell in ignorance will betray themselves. For brothers, that are, uh, the, the greatest document, I'm telling you now, this is going to free every man and woman and child around the world. The document, and it will. For we have no forsaken ourselves. Document is perfect. 
and I'm telling you right now, I don't care about the articles. But once you free your souls when they're a satanic cult, you're free. The greatest thing. Very, very well they, said. Um, now, to move forward, in which language do we address them and which court do we deal with? So if it's we don't, naval we, we, law, we don't, we, we don't that's deal. We don't deal. We don't upon all of us. We don't deal with any courts, or there is no court, and this no, is why we're going to deal with a court. No, we're, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're, no, we're not. No, we're not. Well, we're going to need to deal with a court or debunk a court. In which language do we address them? We address them in, in English because English is, is a language they understand most. For it's the greatest language in the world, English. Secondly, there'll be no court. For once, the people rise together. This constitution will never stop. Trust me. It's not going to work, though. Yes. Okay. So we're all ready for this. Now, in which language do we address them? English. And I, I've, already spoke, I've already spoken. I've already spoken. I've already spoken. I've already spoken to the language, my friend. English. I know, but in the meantime, in the meantime, Dallas, like there is the the chance that you know, for some whatever reason, they may try and drag someone there. You know, while while I don't have my own peacekeeping force that is willing to stand in front of my front door and tell the you know the corporate police officer no you are not harming a british you know an english national he is not a british citizen you have no authority over him there is you know the odds that i could be kidnapped and, and physically dragged in front of one of their courts in okay. that case if that happened i would simply use the justice defense if i was forced into their jurisdiction against my will I would use the justice defense and I would just repeat, I am an idiot. And I would keep repeating, I am an idiot until he dismissed <laughs> the case because he forced to do it. Wouldn't you say, uh, I do not understand? Uh, this is not talking anymore. This is the problem. Yeah, so. Would you not ask no, them, you know, idiot. tell them, I I'm do not idiot. understand? No, no. No, 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 no. The problem with that is you are yeah, now, whether you're saying that you don't understand what they're saying or not is irrelevant. You're, you're admitting by, the, by your use of legalese that you do understand their language. By saying I am an idiot, you are saying that you, you, you are completely ignorant of anything that goes on. And it was used by jesters because jesters were protected in the days of the kings. Um, because they were supposed to amuse people, and by so, so that, that meant that Rick, they could Rick, offend Rick, Rick, people. Rick. Dallas. Right, so this, no, no, no. Say whatever you want, and by the end, I am an idiot. That's it. And you are. Talking. That's it. If you and I know people that have used this successfully in court. They have just repeated, "I am an idiot," over and over and over again. And as long as you do not stray from that, and you don't try anything fancy. Because the problem when you start trying to use legalese against them is you've got to have your T's and your I's absolutely spot on. If they're not crossed and dotted, they will hang you. They will absolutely hang you because they, they work and live this. You know, um, the judge is basically an actor, as are all the lawyers. It's a great big play that they're putting on and they have lines that have to be said at certain times. And if you get your line wrong, then you end up prosecuted. If you get your lines right, then you'll walk out of that. And the only right line that you can use if you're forced into their jurisdiction and they, and they won't let you try and refute it is just to say, I'm an idiot. What, when they ask you who you are, say you're an idiot. Anything, don't, don't ever answer anything but I'm an idiot. And the worst thing you can do is be silent because silent is tacit complicity. It's tacit agreement in their language. If you don't say anything, that's why they give you the right to remain silent because they want you to, because they can presume anything of you then. Fucking and 19 the fact that you don't so, refuse so, so. You do not understand for sure that you are an idiot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Beatrice. <laughs> well, it's not so far, but the problem is how you prove that you are an idiot. This is another problem. <laughs> so anyway... Um, Eric, what is your opinion about right? Okay, aliens. 
that's that's a big question. That is that is a really really big question. Um, I, I I do think that there are entities that exist that that don't live off this earth. Um, and I think we've been lied to an awful lot about how the universe actually works. And that is a root of our misunderstanding of a lot of, of what aliens are, so to speak. Um, long story short, I do think that there are entities, intelligent entities besides human beings. Um, it does appear to me that they have had some influence, um, particularly in our deep past. Um, and um, possibly have been the root of some of our um, ancient understandings of God. Um, and I think this, this was most apparent to me when you look at the fairly schizophrenic nature of the Bible. Um, between the Old and the New Testament, you've got two very different sorts of God being portrayed. You've got the God that was portrayed in the Old Testament, who is fallible, so he makes mistakes. He, he created a, a you know a, a species that somehow were imperfect, and I don't see how a, an omnipotent, omniscient being could make such a mistake. And then there's talk of him having human-like emotions. So you know, being angry and and like to me, like that's that's a human thing. If you're if you're God and you see all and know all, then when you bring something into existence you know its life path. And that doesn't mean you've not given it free will because while it's separated from the whole or has this sensation of being separate, it has to make decisions in the moment. But that doesn't mean if you were powerful enough and you created that being in a certain way that you wouldn't know how it would choose to act in every given situation. Whether that's its choosing independent of you or not, you are still aware of how that being would choose to act. So um, that to me speaks to something that is fallible, something that was not omnipotent, that was not omniscient, you know, that, that was unhappy with its creation. And I don't see how a, you know, a all loving, all seeing, all knowing God could, could ever be unhappy with something it's brought into being. So that speaks to me to two very different points of creation in that perhaps we, we were created by, or, 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 our, or our upbringing was influenced from entities from the outside. I think there's an awful lot of evidence of that. Um, though the exact mechanism of that occurring, I, I'm still not exactly sure of. Um, and I think a lot of our understanding about how these beings get here um, is very different to the, the reality. I don't think anything is flying across the vast distances of space, put it that way. Um, I think when we get a greater understanding of, of the way the universe actually works, we'd realise that we can actually be at any place or time we choose to be, just by willing ourselves there. Uh, and I think that's how such advanced species do actually communicate. In fact, I don't even think they need to actually come here. They could communicate with us telepathically from across all time because ultimately the universe is all all one thing anyway and intimately connected so why wouldn't they be able to do such a thing and uh you know perhaps we're, we're in more touch with them than we actually think nice <laughs> so no that's a it's a very good point interesting theories and um, even if there were aliens on Earth, uh, creator of all things, um, you know, solar systems and uh, the galaxy and whatnot. Interesting things, very interesting. But now, back on Earth, which laws are we going to use and which language would be best to deal with the situation? Natural law and um, um, this constitution is written already on English and will be uh, translated also in Latin. Yeah, so it's about the natural law. So the, the main thing is, is oh, that the yeah, law yeah. is available. 
okay. in the tongue of the person who needs to read it I think like that's that's it like it's in places where you've got multilingual cultures I mean I, I imagine this is probably particularly important in Canada I suppose because you've got French and English that are used you know side by side in, in a lot of cases so you would have to have someone who was multilingual who would be able to make sure that 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 common translation worked because as I understand, you know, language, it's, it's very easy for things to be miscommunicated. There's a lot of nuance well, to, to yeah. language, particularly when you're switching it between languages. Okay. So all languages come from a common point, um, which language should be best in an in international court. Mm. I, I, I don't think that's a decision that can be made by a single person. Like that's, that's something that... International court, but first of all, we are not sovereign in every country to have an international court under... Yeah. First of all, to be sovereign, then by there, we not allow them by there for sure, the, internet, the international court can be the natural law. So if we reject all the main law, and we become sovereign and practically our sovereignty is given also through the natural law. We cannot choose another law on the international. Well, this is the beauty of, uh, of what they've been doing in America. And this is why I'm, I'm trying to link us all, all together with what Anna von Reitz is doing, because a lot of work they had to be sovereign in order for them to form a union. Like if the state, the state's not sovereign, it can't make the decision to form the union. And if the people aren't sovereign, they can't make the decision to form the state or the county or, or whatever anything else is. So it's got to come back to, like, say, the, the people. And, and each individual state is shielded from this dangerous maritime jurisdiction by being in a union. It's a, a nation of nations. It's a, a group of nations that have all agreed to operate on the same basic principles so that they can trade under land law. And what we need to do is expand that idea out to include Canada, to include Britain, to include all, all the nations of planet Earth, all the individual sovereign nations okay. Okay, pause, need pause, to pause, come pause. together so that we can trade in land law rather than ever involving this war, maritime, commerce, jurisdiction. And then we never need to touch that in the first place. They can go Every and live state. on the ocean if they want to. Every, every state is, is, is a independent nation. And it, this is why it's so important. As, as, as Canada, right? The provinces, right? Are independent nations. And I look at 1871, right? Of the, the, of the uh, Confederation, which was a lying document. They created a document that was a lie. I look at Montana, Idaho. My brother's to the south of me. They never ratified the Constitution. It's very important now for us as free men to understand this law. There's, there's been no law. So any nation that says there's any law, prove me a law for for our father. No, there's no law. There's I remember no the Charlottetown Accord and nobody got a referendum. Nobody voted on the Charlottetown Accord. It was just rammed right down the center. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. And this has happened every time. Every yes. time that a country or a nation has tried to do this, silence is no more. This is the greatest constitution ever written. I know that. You know why? It's I actually participated in writing this constitution. And it's, it's like now, this is a very, very deep concentration.
I never anticipated in my life the gender situations. But these are these here were not from my creator. I created created a man of one. And I can see the the, uh, the attacks, the harm, and the lies. I call it a, a, a disease. Sad. You know, me and that, and we've talked for five years, six years, seven years. Alaska is gone. You know why they're all gone? Because the people will never understand their power. And that's the truth. And they, and, and they will destroy our nation. Absolutely. That's what they do to destroy nations. Now, we need to take their hands off. And how do we deal with it? Like, we're going to have to go through a court? No, no, you're not. No, no, we don't no, need to start. There's, no, there's, no, there's no courts. Not unless they actually physically drag you in front of it, then no, you don't ever walk into one of no. their courts and take so, them in their courts. You just no. build your own system of governance. You decide what things you want to have, what, what things you want to collectively look after, and you set up the system by which that happens. So, so you so, create your own administrative so, so. offices yep. for whatever yep. services you yep. want, yep. and then you hire people to do that job. Initially, it'll yeah. be volunteers like me and you. The first people in will take on those roles and we'll, we'll get that rolling. Um, I mean, for, for my my point of view, the first thing I want to do is is bring people together who are willing to, to do this with me. So that involves get, creating a set of documents by which they identify themselves as being a living person, you know, a man or a woman. And um, they say that they are no longer a British citizen, they are now a, an English national or a Welsh national or a Scottish national or a Northern Irish national. Those are the four nations that make up England. You could think of them like the states of America, yeah? That's, that's comparative in terms of, you know, the, the understanding of how the system works. Um, and Canada, effectively, is, is one of those states as well that currently is under the, the via the Commonwealth part of the, the crown rulership. That's how their system's working at the moment. But in terms of like a, a proper Republican government, um, you know, each one of those states, the, you know, country of Northern Ireland, the country of Wales, the country of England, the country of Scotland would all, you know, be sovereign on their own. So the first thing I do is I mean, give people the method by which they can declare themselves as being the person who is you know living on that land and soil and doesn't want to be ruled by the crown and from there we use those people to start filling those roles first one being the position of a, a recorder so the person literally able to to take other people and say oh you want to be part of this fantastic sign these documents we'll keep them on record and if anybody asks us who you are we can say that you're not british you're english or you're Welsh, or you're Scottish, and we can prove that if they try and drag you into a court. And the idea is there, you set it up so well, and it's so official, that the worst thing they could do is ever drag you into a court. That is the absolute worst thing you could do, because you would prove their con right there and then in front of them, in their own jurisdiction, because you've conferred yourself out of it. Mm. How does that's, that work for you in England as far as the UK goes and this Brexit deal? Like, where do you guys stand? Like, are you guys part of the UK or part of the <coughs> European Union? 
I get, honestly, I've I've not paid any attention to I'll, 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 I will cut I will, I will cut it in a second. So Nigel Naj Faraj is part of fucking uh, the Trump fucking Zionist Jew propaganda. Nigel Faraj was just a fucking another fucking Jew ripping you off on the Brexit fucking deal. So you know. Do you have, it's me, Nigel oh, Faraj. I'm going to have to go. I'll say, I'll, 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 so if they've got a hey. couple more questions, I could do with just answering a couple more questions and then heading off to bed. It's like 2 a.m. here. But, uh, I know, I know. No. So, yeah, no, that's what, that's what I mean. So, okay. So. so okay. No. What we have on general provision inside of our constitution, when this constitution enter for that nation, all other laws become unconstitutional. So practically you are not part of uh, the <laughs> European because all other laws become, become uh, under the investigation if they are for the sovereign or against the sovereign. So, but there you will choose that. The sovereign will choose the, the sovereign of that nation. And probably they will say no. So all other laws will be repealed. This is the general yeah. above the part one we... Well, this, this is what it comes down to, isn't it? Like, if you declare yourself as a man, and, and this is what I was saying before about all law coming back to the ancient British, ancient English laws, the Magna Carta and the, the Charter of the Forest are included in that. And the Charter of the Forest says, if you are a man, and you are not a person, then you can't be held accountable for the person. And it's as simple as that. Once you've declared yourself as being a living man and not a legal person, you can't be held for those forest offences, which is where all this whole maritime law, legal, corporate nonsense has come from, this idea of forest law and the forest offences. Become unconstitutional, exactly. This is yeah. the provision. Yeah, it's going to be nice. It's been great having you here, Rick. Uh, I know it's uh, getting late here uh, on your right. end of the world. If anybody um, has one more, I'm, I'm quite happy to do one more. I really don't mind. But um, I'll, I'll have to make it the last one. Yeah. If anybody's got anything you've else. You've answered all my about. questions. So if somebody I, else I, has a question. I just have one question. Will you come back again, Rick, please? <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure I, I always will yeah we'll, we'll make uh, it a little we'll earlier be... we'll make it earlier <laughs> i don't mind i don't mind it's been thank a you. great discussion thank it's you for your time discussion. brother we we like picking your brain and it's great to hear from somebody on your end where you're at and we have a lot of similarities and we really have a lot of the same problems and yeah. it's been great. Oh, Rick, yeah. I'm uh, not the best one to do the video, but uh, the Earth is our home. We'll be just presenting to the next summit. It's all right. That's quite all right. right. Uh, just one caveat, guys. I just want to say, um, like, I'm only doing my best to research here, and I'm only giving you the truth and honest understanding and inner standing and overstanding and comprehension, whatever language you want to use, of this as, as, so, I, as I'm coming to, to learn it and I am always prepared to be corrected on details details is where so, I fall short I'm the big picture man so if no. anyone's got details that contradict me I'm, I'm willing to be corrected on points but this is where I've got to with my understanding so far so uh, Rick thank you you it's been a pleasure you know why um, now I'm going to ask you a question, my friend, your honesty and your integrity. Now, I'm going to publish everything you say to me from now on. What's important to me is this, is your category of history. And the world will see you where you were, for you are.
and it's, it's exquisite to me. So, no more. Your, your videos will see 70 views, and I will publish your videos to the world. And uh, that's important to me. Important to you too, to be honest. You know, Mark Vasio, he has no views. It, it was it was great. It was very good speaking to you. Uh, you bring the international to both of our nations. So thank you. I, I am really looking forward to working with you guys in the future. To keep doing what you're doing, what well, it's it's absolutely amazing. Um, I'd love to see a copy of your constitution. It would be a great thing that I can use as a beginning to start to present to my own. Um, you know, people on these lands and, uh, we, you know, we can start to, to figure out some things ourselves and perhaps even share information between us as well. I think that is, could be important if we can make this document international yeah. um, and take into account opinions of people in, in different cultures across the, the whole globe, then, you know, that increases its power exponentially as well, because that allows us to bring everybody under our own agreement about you know what natural law actually is and what it looks like in reality and, and what it can do for all of us as uh, people of the earth so brother rick you know what we have to do we have to keep in contact and we have to share information and we have to do this let's get this you know we will come to your meetings over there mm -hmm. you come to our meetings we start sharing with this is a worldwide movement brother so, it has to be the third video hey. of uh, Rico. So, so Rick, 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 Rick. So Rick, do you have, do you have, do you have, do you have chat on the side? Sorry. Do you have chat on the side? Yes, I can. I can chat. Hey. Okay. So you have chat. So Beatrice, yeah. Scott, everybody, send Rick your address, and I'll tell you right now, brother. Well, I love you, and guess what? All right, thanks a lot. So. Take care of yourself, guys. Hey, listen to me. Hey, I brought you for one reason. You know what? You know, right? And I did. Hey. They're not alone. That's important as well right now. It was great. It, it was great. We acknowledge stuff. We never contradicted each other. We just collaborated. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Rick. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Looking forward to seeing you again, Rick. Take Good night care. for now. Mike. Throw me your, throw me your, uh, your uh, email, just.